As Hugh said, my name is David Kling, and I'm the chair of the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Miami. It's my privilege to introduce this evening's speaker, my colleague, Justin Ritzinger. I want to emphasize that it is a privilege, but I must add it's also a, how should I put it, cheerful obligation for on this Ash Wednesday in the Christian calendar, when I should be at a service dedicated to the cult of Jesus, I find myself here for a book talk, ironically, on the Buddhist cult of Maitreya. <laughs> Professor Ritzinger is a Wisconsin native who earned his bachelor's degree from Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin. Following his undergraduate studies, Justin lived in Taiwan for four years, where he honed his language skills in Chinese as a translator at Dharma Drum Mountain, an international Buddhist cultural spiritual and educational foundation. He then went on to earn his doctorate at Harvard University in 2010 and before arriving at the university in 2013 Professor Ritzinger taught at Oberlin College and Ball State University. A few words about the book that Justin will discuss this evening uh, published in 2017 you see the title there published by Oxford University Press Anarchy in the Pure Land Tradition, Modernity, and the Reinvention of the Cult of Maitreya, it's already received high praise from reviewers. I want to give you just a few snippets. One reviewer, this monograph, quote, will undoubtedly establish him as one of the world's leading authorities on modern Buddhism in the Chinese world. Are you ready for that? <laughs> Another uh, this book will be indispensable for anyone interested in the history of modern Chinese Buddhism or the history of modern China. Another, a model of innovative scholarship. And one more, a pioneering study of the eminent Buddhist monk Tai Shu. And by the way, Tai Shu's reputation in China has been likened to that of Martin Luther King Jr. in America. Should of course tell us that he is a pretty significant figure in modern Chinese Buddhism. I could go on with more superlatives, but it's now time for the author to speak for himself. I'm honored to present Professor Justin Ritzinger. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction. Uh, thank you to the Humanity Center and Hugh and Mihoko. Uh, and also to Books and Books for giving me the opportunity to do this. Uh, as someone recently remarked to me, usually in, the, huma or in uh, the academy, we tend to always be talking about the next project, so this is kind of a rare opportunity to slow down uh, and talk about one that has already been completed. Uh, this book was a long time in the making. All books are. Uh, there might be a few people who kick out books in a year, but they don't admit that because we all hate people like that. <laughs> uh, but this book really was quite a long time in the making. Right? The first seeds were actually sown back when Bill Clinton was being impeached. <laughs> this was still a source of excitement rather than bitter, bitter disappointment. <laughs> and I was rocking floppy 90s hair. <laughs> it was the beginning of 1999, and I was a student at Lawrence University and working on my honors thesis on this figure, Master Taishu, who lived from 1890 to 1947. Uh, as David mentioned, he is an extremely important figure for 20th century Chinese Buddhism, uh, as important as Martin Luther King in the sense that he is not the end-all and be-all. There were a lot of other figures as well. Uh, and also, much like Martin Luther King, he's rather misremembered, uh, and that happened rather quickly. So when I was writing my thesis, I focused on his signature ideas, right? Human life, Buddhism, and the pure land on earth, right? Human life, Buddhism is this idea of reorienting the Buddhist tradition, taking it from something that was concerned with rights for the dead, and focusing it on the practicalities of human life. Uh, and the pure land on earth was the idea, idea that one of Buddhism's missions should be social uplift, right? We should be trying to improve society uh, and build a better world through our religious practice. So the way that this was presented, and at the time that I started this, there was really no scholarship on it uh, to speak of. But this was presented as a kind of modern Buddhism, right? 
Uh, it was engaged, it was rational, it was scientific. And as I was writing my thesis, this is more or less the line that I hewed to, right? This was modern religion, right? Engaged, rational, and scientific. But, as so often happens, there was a problem, right? So, besides looking at uh, works in English uh, that were contemporaneous to Taishu and a few scattered things that had been written about him by scholars, I was also looking at Chinese language works, uh, the ones that I could get my hands on. And one of them was a brief biography by this gentleman, a student of Taishu's named Xu Ming. And so as I'm reading through this bi biography, most of the things I know, but then we get to a passage where he suddenly drops that, by the way, Taishu practices Maitreya pure land. Right? And this caused a great deal of difficulty for me because what the hell is Maitreya pure land anyway? Uh, I had never heard of this before. Uh, for my students who have kindly shown up today, this was back in the days right before Google became a thing. <laughs> and sometimes if you didn't know something, you just didn't know it. And you couldn't find out, and that was it. I knew what all the individual words meant, right? So I knew who Maitreya was, right? Maitreya is the Buddha of the future, right? So at some point very, very far into the future, he will descend to this world. He will attain Buddhahood just as the historical Buddha did. At that time, this world will be a paradise. Uh, he is currently chilling out in Tushita heaven, as all Buddhas do, prior to their attainment of Buddhahood, where he is essentially the lord of the inner court in Tushita heaven. Uh, he's also closely associated with a school of thought called Yogacara. And he becomes seen as a kind of messiah of the masses in China, uh, because he has this association with a perfect world in the future. In the orthodox tradition, he doesn't bring it about, uh, but in popular belief, he was sometimes seen that way. And I knew what Pure Land was, right? The Pure Land was the paradise of Amitabha Buddha, the Buddha of limitless life. And it serves as a kind of opulent dharmic halfway house, right? So you try to be reborn in the Pure Land. Once you're there, you are secure on the path. You can't backslide on the astronomically long uh, path to Buddhahood because you are essentially in this sort of perfect dharmic boot camp. Uh, so it refers to that pure land and also the practices designed to get you there, particularly reciting the name of Amitabha. But what did the one have to do with the other, and what did that have to do with Taishu, right? Taishu was supposed to hate that kind of stuff, right? That was supposed to be exactly the sort of stuff that he didn't like, right? He was supposed to be not for worshipping bodhisattvas, but being a bodhisattva in your own life. He was supposed to be not about being reborn in a pure land somewhere else, but turning this world into a pure land now, right? So what was he doing, right? Why was he doing something called Maitreya Pure Land? And so, of course, I did what any intelligent undergrad would do. I swept that right <laughs> under the rug, right? <laughs> the word Maitreya does not appear in my undergrad thesis at all because I had no idea what to do with it, right? I couldn't even figure out what this was. I looked in my dictionaries, my advisor looked in his dictionaries. We didn't know what this was. So, I ignored it. Right? But I had this kind of nagging doubt, right? That stayed with me during my years in Asia and stayed with me into graduate school. What if we're wrong, right? What if I'm wrong, right? What if I said something uh, that is not quite accurate because I ignored this thing that I didn't know what to do with? Right? And as I went to graduate school and there started to be a bit more scholarship, on the topic, if there was an error, people kept doubling down on it, right? So you found people saying things like, Taishu wanted to get rid of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, right? Or Taishu had little use for the ways of faith and worship, right? Always cited in the Dothraki style, right? It is known. No one bothers to explain how they got this idea. It's just what's known. Except, of course, that it's not. Right? And as I went deeper into the primary source materials, it became more and more clear that this was not the case at all. Uh, so just to give kind of a quick example, uh, this gentleman, uh, Bin Zong, is a Taiwanese monk who visits Shedoshan, uh, a temple that Taishu was the abbot of in 1936, writes a magazine about it, or a magazine article about it, and what he talks about is all of the Maitreyan stuff that he sees happening, right? This is a temple that has a special association with Maitreya. They are reciting Maitreyan scriptures. They have classes on the Maitreyan text. They're reciting Maitreya's name, right? They're doing all of this Maitreyan stuff. And at the end of this, one of his big takeaways, right? His impression of Taishu and his movement is the purity of the great master's devotion, 
right? So how did we miss this? How is something that is so obvious to Binzong completely missed by scholarship that we even have people saying he wanted to get rid of the bodhisattvas when when Binzong actually goes there, he sees nothing but the bodhisattva, right? So what do we do this? How do we solve a problem like Maitreya? Right, and part of the answer that uh, I proffer in the book is that you've got to back up to theory, right? Theory is the lens with which we look at phenomena. It shapes what we see in part because it tells us what to look at, right? So if we are systematically blind to the importance of time that Maitreya had to this modernizing figure, then maybe there's a problem with the way we're thinking about modernity, right? And the way that most scholars, at least in my field, had been thinking about modernity was in terms of a push model, or what I call at least a push model. And you see this in the kind of rhetoric that people use all the time, right? So modernity is a challenge, and then religion has to make a response, right? There's a change, and religion has to adapt, right? There's kind of an implicit biological metaphor where religion is a species, there's a change in the environment, and you have to adapt or go extinct. Right. And basically what's lurking in the background here is secularization theory, right? The idea that there's something fundamentally hostile to religion about modernity, and so eventually right, we are going to end up at Star Trek, right, where everybody's just kind of uh, a nice secular humanist. Right? The space for religion shrinks, the options shrink, uh, until eventually there's nothing left at all. Of course, this is rooted in the theories of Weber, and there have been more sophisticated versions of this, very sophisticated versions of this, but in a lot of ways, they end up at the same kind of consensus, right? What a modern religion is going to look like is that it's rational, right? It's ethical, it's engaged, right? All of those kind of things, and that fits very well with a lot of what Taishu is doing. Right? This is what theory tells us to look at, and when we look at it, we find lots of stuff. So it makes a lot of sense that people employ this lens, and they weren't wrong uh, in many ways to do so. Except that when you read Taish's work, he doesn't seem pushed. Right? He's not challenged by modernity, he's excited by it. He wants to be modern, and he wants it bad. And he also has this Maitreya stuff going on. So part of what I argue in the book is that we have to flip our perspective and look at modernity not in terms of a push, although of course there is a push uh, that's involved, uh, but as a pull, right? There is a lure to modernity, right? It exercises a kind of attraction as well as compulsion, right? And so I draw on uh, Charles Taylor to think about modernity in cultural rather than acultural terms. It's not just a dropping away of the scales after which you just see things as they are, right? So tradition has blinded us, that goes away and then boom, modernity happens, right? You're just left with rationality. Rather, it's a contingent cultural constellation that's driven in part by its own positive vision of the good, right? And the process by which it comes about is additive and transformative rather than simply subtractive. Right? It's not just that you get rid of tradition and then you have modernity. Modernity emerges through this additive and transformative process. And this makes a lot more sense for looking at the cult of Maitreya. And I use this because that is Taishu dressed up as Maitreya. Uh, and I think he's super cute in this picture, uh, <laughs> which is good for the attraction of modernity. Right, so I draw on Taylor's Sources of the Self, uh, which some of you are probably familiar with, and particularly his idea of moral frameworks. Right, so essentially, Taylor argues that moral frameworks are a precondition for a coherent human existence. Right? We have to have some conception of what is good, what is a good life, which doesn't entail that we actually do it, but we have to have some conception of what a good life is in order to live a coherent existence. And these moral frameworks are essentially tacit cognitive maps of what that good life is. Right? And a moral framework is anchored by a hypergood, right? a good which is qualitatively higher than the others, and provides the basis upon which you judge the value of these other goods. These are multiple, uh, and they're frequently unarticulated. Right? Most people are not cartographers of moral space, they're navigators. Right? They're trying to live their life well, they're not trying to build great theories about what is ultimately true uh, or ultimately important. Right. And so in Taylor's account of Western modernity, he provides an account of how the modern Western constellation of values came to be. I won't summarize it. It's 900 pages. It's a great book, uh, but beyond summary, the key points for me is that it involves these three moral frameworks that are historically interrelated, 
right? They emerge in dialogue with each other. Uh, they are internally heterogeneous, so they conflict with each other. Uh, they borrow from each other. They are reliant on each other. And so you have both tension and dependence. So Western modernity is internally heterogeneous, and it involves through this additive and transformative process. Right. And modernity becomes distinct, but not a rupture. Right? It's not all the old stuff going away. It's not tradition disappearing. It's a new configuration of traditions. All right, so part of what I tried to do is develop a kind of Taylorian approach to alternative modernities. Right, and I posit that the formation of alternative modernities includes the formation of new constellations of hypergoods as individuals adopt novel moral frameworks, typically without abandoning the old ones. So you encounter these novel moral frameworks, or these, right, these new hypergoods, and you're moved by them. And that's Taylor's language. You're moved, not convinced. Right? This is something that is not simply a matter of sort of articulated rationality. It comes both sort of below and deeper than that. So you're moved by these, but you don't necessarily abandon the old ones. Right? You continue to be motivated by those visions of the good, and now you're sort of left to try to find some way of making sense of their relationship. Right? I think most people do this through kind of an unacknowledged logic of uh, algebraic equivalence. Right? So you have sort of two sides of the equation. You've got an equal sign. They're both true, so they must somehow fit it together. Right? And the process by which these are developed is characterized by mutual transformation and transvaluation, right? So as these two frameworks come into contact, they're both transformed in the encounter, right? You read one framework in light of the other, uh, and vice versa. Things that appeared good uh, might now appear to be bad. Uh, they exist in tension and hybridity, and they go through a whole series of articulations, right? People are not necessarily looking at this explicitly is, now I'm going to build this moral system, they have these moral intuitions that they're then left to make sense with, of in the context of their lives. Right. And these constructions are articulated and transmitted through doctrine and ideology, right? so explicit ideas, but also symbols and practice. Right. So basically, the argument of the book, in one sentence, uh, is that Taishu and his associates' reinvention of the cult of Maitreya represents the convergence of hypergoods of Buddhahood and revolutionary utopia. Right, we'll come back to what I mean by both of those as we go. Right, so if we're going to take this perspective on Western modernity, it won't do to just say, well, Taishu encountered modernity. Right? If modernity is internally heterogeneous, you have to look at exactly what it was that he encountered. So most of the time when people have tried to go into more detail with this, they've talked about Christianity because that seems to be the apples and apples way to go. But Taishu didn't really have any deep contact with Christianity. And when he did, he wasn't really, frankly, all that impressed with it. Right? So what was it that did make a deep impression on him? Anarchism. Right? So anarchy in the Pure Land is not just playing the Sex Pistols. Uh, there really was anarchism involved in the narrative. Right? So Taishu becomes a monk in 1908. Uh, he is tapped uh, very early on in the process of his ordination as a talented young man to receive the very best education uh, that a monk of his day uh, could hope to achieve. And he seems to be bound for kind of a conventional route to greatness. <coughs> so how does he get hooked up with anarchism? Right, so 1911 is when the Chinese Revolution hits. So he is becoming a monk at the same time that revolutionary thought is really starting to make an impact in China. And he gets involved with revolutionaries, he's reading all these books at a time when he is still very young and impressionable. He's only 18 years old when he starts reading things like Kropotkin, um, right, works on revolution, uh, the great anarchist thinkers, and a little, little bit of Marx. Right? The way that this is usually presented in scholarship is that this is kind of a phase, right? So, okay, he's young, he reads some books, he sort of dallies with some revolutionaries in Guangzhou for a couple of months, right, right before the 1911 revolution. But, you know, then he goes back to Buddhism, and of course that's, right, that's where the real story is. So one of the things that I show in the book, although we're not really going to get into it in great depth, is that this is just wrong. Uh, he was actually one of the leading anarchists in China for three years, uh, from 1911 to 1913. Uh, scholars of anarchism have actually known about this the whole time, uh, but no one in the religious study side of things thought to look at it. Uh, there were also a lot of lost texts uh, that I managed to locate 
uh, and used to reconstruct this period of his life. But so he's deeply involved in this. Uh, and you can see sort of a whole series of articulations where he tries to bring ideas of utopia and revolution together with ideas of Buddhism. That ends in 1913 uh, when he goes into a three-year sealed retreat, which was a common practice and still is a common practice uh, in Chinese Buddhism. Usually this is presented as simply being a religious thing, but it's also a political thing, right? 1913 is the aftermath of the second revolution in China, which failed, right? You ended up with an authoritarian strongman. Uh, people tried to rise up against him and he crushed them. So most of Tai Shu's friends got killed or had to flee the country. So when he seals himself uh, in a monastery on Putoshan, he's kind of openly in hiding, right? Uh, he is in some degree of trouble with the law, uh, and so he is purposefully taking himself out of circulation, amongst other things, right? So even though Taishu leaves anarchism in 1913, so after that he does not identify with anarchism, he doesn't explicitly draw on anarchism for the most part, anarchism never leaves him. Right. Once you've been moved by uh, these moral frameworks, they can continue to play a role in your thought, even if you ditch the sort of explicit ideology in which they're embedded. Right. So he still retains this revolutionary utopian framework, uh, by which I mean this idea of utopia as a future world of human happiness and fulfillment, achieved by bottom-up transformation through heroic moral activism and guided by scientific knowledge. Right? This basically comes out of his understanding of Kropotkin. Right. So, I turn to sort of the bulk or the core of the book uh, and the Maitreya School. All right, so the Maitreya School is officially founded in 1924 uh, with the publication of the preface to the three essentials of the Maitreya School. All right, so the word that I'm translating is school here, Zong, uh, it doesn't mean sect, it's something more like a school of thought, uh, even a theme of the Buddhist teachings, uh, rather than something that you would have some sectarian affiliation to. So he writes this preface that draws together these three texts, uh, which are the chapter on knowing reality, the Yoga Bodhisattva Prarimoksha, and the Sutra of Maitreya's Ascent. Right, so the proximate sort of background causes for this are one, a wave of interest in Yogacara. So Yogacara, for reasons that we can go into it in the Q&A if people actually are interested, becomes really hot in China for a while. Uh, and so this text and this text are both spun out of the Yogacara Bhuma Shastra, uh, which is said to have been preached by Maitreya, right? So it's a Yogacara text preached by Maitreya. He has this connection to Yogacara, and Maitreya was the object of devotion for a lot of Yogacara thinkers. So that's one factor. Uh, Japanese scholarship may have played a role as well, possibly also the murals at Dunhuang, uh, which depict various Buddhist paradises, including that of Maitreya. But I think that the real attraction is that these particular set of texts correspond very well with these sort of underlying elements of the revolutionary utopian framework. Right? So they have real resonances, right? ones that he's not making up, uh, with key components of that framework. He reads them through that framework. So these texts are, for the most part, not paid a great deal of attention to. He lifts them up, makes them important, because he sees those resonances. And then in his commentaries, he enhances those resonances at the expense of distorting the text. So one of the sort of confirmations that this is really what's happening is that he says stuff in his commentaries that do not make sense if you're looking at what the text says, but make a lot of sense if you know about his anarchist background. Uh, as a result, his Maitreyan theology brings the anarchist-derived hypergood of utopia, perfected society, into constellation with the Buddhist hypergood of Buddhahood, or perfected self. This is sort of how that correlation lays out. So each of these texts are divided, uh, and this is a division that he makes, according to this rubric of the Buddhist path. It's a Yogacara rubric. So you have the object of knowledge, which corresponds to the chapter on knowing reality, practice, which corresponds to the Yoga Bodhisattva Paraita Moksha, and the fruit, which corresponds to the Sand Sutra. And then the connection that I make is that this essentially corresponds with uh, the, the chapter, moral activism with the Prati Moksha, and utopia with the Sutra. And we'll unpack <coughs> all of that as we go. And there's also a lot more interconnections, but we're just going to go with those three uh, so that we finish tonight. <laughs> right, so the chapter on knowing reality uh, is a brief chapter from this very long text called the Yogacara Bhumi Shastra that focuses on 
knowledge and contemplation of reality as it is, as the center of the path, as kind of its precondition for successful uh, cultivation. Uh, and its central doctrine, uh, the thing that's concerned is to reveal the true nature of phenomena in their actuality. Uh, that is, they are empty and ineffable, right? So in Buddhism, uh, in Mahayana Buddhism, things are seen as being empty. They don't exist from their own side. They have no individual existence, right? They exist only in dependence on all other things. So essentially, if you take away all other things, that thing does not exist in any sense at all, right? So in a sense, it's null. It's empty. It's not there. And so when we refer to that thing as David, right, right or Kylie, that is, in a sense, just a joke, right? There's not really a David that can be separated from non-David things, but we're going to throw that out there as a manner of speaking. Reality as it is cannot be spoken of because words by their nature divide a reality that's indivisible. So reality as it is is empty and ineffable. And then on the flip side you have the comprehensive nature of phenomena in their totality, right? Which is that things are conditionally arisen. So even though David might not be separable, or in fact because he is not separable from all things, we can draw out this entire web of cause and effect that explains how we end up with this particular thing that for want of a better word we're going to call Dave. Right? So we have Mon Pa Kling, right? Uh, what he had for breakfast this morning, etc., etc. Right? And without those things we don't have quite this David. Right? So where he starts to pull this toward utopia though, or to the utopian framework, is the correspondence that he finds between that and his definition of science. Right, so science, in Tai Shu's view, seeks true and accurate knowledge of phenomena of every part of the universe and their relationship, and seeks to eliminate the errors of intuition. So, like the text itself, there's both kind of a positive and a negative aspect. You remove things that are untrue, right? You eliminate the errors of intuition, you remove this linguistic overlay that separates an inseparable reality, and then you also have a kind of positive aspect that looks at things in their relationship. And in the text, he goes on to inexplicable lengths uh, to ex turn this into a theory of everything. Right. And he also wants to add, or he also wants to argue that in fact, science is a kind of limited empiricism, right? Because it is only concerned with what the senses can apprehend, and the senses cannot apprehend subjectivity, it is inherently limited. Right? Whereas if you augment it with yogic contemplation, you can in fact come up with a sort of super science. Right? So Buddhism not only includes science, but completes it. Right. The second text is the Yoga Bodhisattva Pradimoksha. A Pradimoksha is a set of precepts. Precepts in Buddhism are vows or rules for training. Right? So these are vows that you take or rules for training that you adopt in order to properly practice the Bodhisattva path. So they serve as a guide for ethical practice and for spiritual cultivation, right? But as he reads this particular text, it also offers an activist ethic of mutual aid, right? Mutual aid uh, was an important term for Kropotkin. So in comparison to these Parimoksha from the Sutra of Brahma's Net, uh, which is much more popular in China, 25 of the 45 precepts are positive. That is, they enjoin you to do something. Most precepts are about not doing stuff. So the term for precept in Chinese, jie, literally means to give stuff up. So you jie cigarettes, right? You jie alcohol, right? But here, it's phrased in a double negative, so these are things that you give up not doing, right? So it's much more positive, much more activist in its orientation. And the particular set of things that it enjoys is much more socially engaged. So you're supposed to serve the sick, uh, you're supposed to aid the unfortunate, right? And if you don't do that, uh, you're committing a sin. And he also sees it as a flexible ethic of revolution, right? It's flexible because it has all of these gradations, which is also unique compared to other systems of precepts. So they're essentially felonies, uh, right, and misdemeanors. So if you break a precept, did you do it on purpose, right? Did you do it out of ill will? Uh, were you just lazy or distracted, right? Was it just habit? And that determines how heavy of an offense it is. Uh, and there's also all these exceptions. So according to this precept text, even something like killing a living being can be a good thing if it is to benefit other sentient beings. 
So for instance, there is a precept that says, if there is a ruler who is oppressing his people, it is the duty of the Bodhisattva to destroy his dominion. Right. And so of course, Taishu loved that, right? He thought that that was awesome, uh, right? So it has all these things that are much different than what you find uh, in a lot of other Buddhist texts. Right. At the same time, it offers a kind of rigor, right? That very nuance creates a need for vigilance. You have to be aware of not only what you've done, but why you've done it. And it requires swift repentance. So according to this text, if you have committed a wrong, you have to repent within 24 hours. Right? So you can't just sort of wait till the end of the week, tally up what you've done and not done. You have to be constantly thinking about what you've done. And it has to be recited on a regular basis. And so Taisho sees this essentially as a kind of guard against secularization. It provides a basis for working in the world, uh, for being engaged with society, for charitable work, building schools, building hospitals, but it keeps you, ideally, from getting too mired in that. Right. And then finally, the Ascent Sutra right, is a text that lays out uh, Maitreya's paradise uh, in the Tushita heaven and the means for being reborn there. Right, so in terms of uh, the Buddhist framework, right, it enjoins rebirth in Maitreya's pure land, although the text does not ever use that term, uh, that is the Tushita inner court, and it offers the promise of non-retrogression. Right? The Bodhisattva path is inconceivably long. It's three Asamkhya Kalpas, which you can reasonably think of as three eternities. Right? It is a tremendously long time, much, much, much longer than the length of time that science tells us it has taken hydrogen to become everything. Right? So a very, very long time. Right? So you don't want to fall back on the path and get lost because then it'll take even longer. If you're reborn in this kind of Dharmic boot camp, you can't fall back. Right? It's like studying a language at Middlebury. You're surrounded by it all the time. <laughs> right? At the same time, the primary mode of securing rebirth there is moral action. Right? Instead of being recitation of the name, although that's mentioned as well, moral action is the primary practice uh, for achieving rebirth there. So initially, this seems to be a kind of insurance policy for him, right? So if you are going to make progress on the Bodhisattva path, you really got to be working at it all the time, right? You have to be engaged in heavy-duty meditation. You have to be reciting the name of Amitabha Buddha. Whatever your practice is, you should be focused on that all the time. And that is exactly what the kind of activist career that he was pursuing, that he was encouraging his students to pursue, did not leave time for, right? You can't be building hospitals, uh, right, running orphanages, and also meditating eight hours a day. It doesn't work, right? So he himself had several enlightened experiences as a young man, never had them again after he left seclusion. So he felt like he spiritually peaked when he was about 23. Uh, so I think that part of that was the sense that he himself had backslid, and he wanted a way to ensure that he would still be on track for Buddhahood. Right? So if you're building an orphanage, you just dedicate the merit of that to rebirth in Maitreya's paradise, because it's moral action that gets you there anyway. What develops, though, is this becomes a kind of two-for-one pure land. Right? So in one of the same action, you are securing rebirth for yourself. Right? So you're doing social good, right? building hospitals, etc. So that improves your standing, it builds your good karma, it allows you to be reborn in Maitreya's Tushita Paradise. At the same time, it purifies this world. right? So through the action of many individuals, from the bottom up, working together, so this is part of the anarchist uh, background and definitely not something that you find in the text itself or in traditional Buddhist thought itself. Everybody purifies this world slowly, gradually, and you have this kind of steady progress that eventually will lead to a utopia, and that will stimulate Maitreya to descend. Right? So the Pure Land on Earth turns out not to, in fact, be a secularized version of Amitabha's Pure Land, but a kind of enchantment of Western views of progress. Right? And at the same time, it sort of solves this utopian dilemma where you're sacrificing everything for a perfect world that you'll never see, because when Maitreya descends, you descend with him, so you get to have your cake and eat it too. Right. So that's kind of the intellectual background of the movement, but it's not just these sort of articulated ideas. It's also something that's encoded uh, in symbols and practice. Right. So Maitreya becomes essentially a kind of bodhisattva of progress. Right. He is the concrete embodiment of futurity, 
of modernity and progress. And so worshiping Maitreya allows people to enter into a different kind of relationship uh, with these abstractions than they would be able to otherwise. Right? Instead of having these abstract ideas, there's a concrete figure uh, that you can look at in the form of an image. Right? That's Maitreya down there. And you can recite his name. Right? And notice the way his name is recited. Homage to Maitreya, the Buddha to come. Right? The future Buddha. Right? In Chinese it's actually Dang Lai Xia Sheng, right? So the Buddha who will descend in the future. Right? So when you're doing this, you're orienting, orienting yourself uh, to this kind of futurity. And in this image, uh, which is taken from one of Tai Shu's journals, this is presented as uh, the lord of the humanistic Buddhist teaching, right? So the human life Buddhism teaching, uh, Shakyamuni, so the historical Buddha. And then this is the lord of the human life Buddhism teaching to come, Maitreya, right? And the positioning here, right, with Shakyamuni above and Maitreya below in Chinese suggests a progression, right? Because in Chinese, you read from top to bottom, right? You talk about next month as being the month below, right? The below month. So this suggests a kind of temporal progression from Shakyamuni to Maitreya. Right? And you also find this in the practices that you see in his movement. So one of his big impacts on later Chinese Buddhism was through his seminaries and monasteries, and this, as Binzo noted, imbues everything that they're doing. So they're having daily recitation of Maitreya's name and of the Sen Sutra, right? monthly recitation of the Yoga, Prati, Yoga Bodhisattva Pratimoksha, they're studying all of these texts, uh, and they have annual Maitrayan retreats at the Lunar New Year, because that's the feast of Maitreya's nativity. Right? And he also encourages his lay disciples to recite the name. So this becomes part of the habitus of his movement. Right? It's something that habituates them to a particular way of engaging with not just Maitreya, but also with the whole notion of modernity. Right? And we see this too uh, in this kind of brief ritual manual that he writes for his lay followers, the daily rites necessary for members of the Right Faith Society, which was a group he was associated with. So you begin by reciting the refuges, Right, so you take refuge in Sakyamuni, the ever-abiding three jewels, and Maitreya, then you recite a verse, right? then you recite Maitreya's name, and then you dedicate the merit of all this to, to Shida. But what's interesting is this aspect. Right? So you begin with Sakyamuni, then you go to the ever-abiding three jewels, then Maitreya, and he offers these mandalas, right? which look nothing like any mandalas uh, that I've seen anywhere else. Right? These are translated, but this is basically what they look like. So this is the first one that you are to contemplate as you do this, and note that it has this kind of temporal progression. So you have Shakyamuni in the center as the origin point, then the ever-abiding Buddha, right? Arrows going downward to the ever-abiding Sangha, ever-abiding Dharma, then next you contemplate this, where the arrows extend down from the ever-abiding Sangha and the ever-abiding Dharma down to Maitreya. So you have the sense of temporal progression. So you begin with the past, right, with Shakyamuni, then the present three jewels, the Buddha, Dharma, and the Sangha is the representative of the world today, and then move to Maitreya. So as you move through this ritual progression, you're taking from past to present to future, and finally dedicate the merit to the rebirth into Shida. Fine. Yeah, the <laughs> temporal progression. All right, so in conclusion, right, the reformists are not secularized and demythologized as they have often been presented, right? Maitreya was a key element. Uh, ritual and devotion had their place, right? They were not trying to get rid of this stuff. Uh, we just weren't looking in the right place for it. Uh, and the pure land on earth actually had a real eschatological dimension, right? It's not just a secularization of Amitabha pure land. It's an enchantment of progress. Uh, and the cult was not a throwback, but a key site for articulating a Buddhist vision of modernity. Right? It brings together the hyper goods of Buddhahood and utopia in a meaningful relationship. So the chapter on knowing reality combines insight into emptiness and a super scientific knowledge. Uh, the Yoga Bodhisattva Pradimoksha combines an activist revolutionary act ethic uh, that nevertheless avoids secularization. And the Ascent Sutra offers non-retrogression and also a two-for-one pure land. Right. And all this is encoded in symbol and ritual that is an important part of his movement. Right. So I think some of the benefits of looking at uh, modernities this way is one that it recognizes the internal heterogeneity of modernities, uh, which 
calls attention to the specific strands and articulations, right? You can't just talk about modernity. You have to ask yourself which one, right? What is it that's actually operating in that particular environment? If Taishu had gone to a mission school or if he'd fallen in with uh, members of the Communist Party, he would have ended up with something quite different than he ended up with, with anarchism. Uh, and so it calls for a kind of more rigorous historicization uh, than at least in my field has sometimes been pursued. Uh, and it helps us to move beyond this kind of change in adaptation, right? Which isn't necessarily bad or wrong, uh, but has yielded, I think, most of the insight uh, that it's going to. Uh, and it helps us to look for modernity in new places, right? In places that we haven't looked before uh, and engages us with new materials uh, that we might have neglected in the past. And it helps keep in focus why Chinese Buddhists wanted to be modern and also why they wanted to be Buddhist. Thank you. <laughs> 38 minutes. Yeah, um, as I was listening to you talk about Taisho, I was reminded of another revolutionary who um, used Buddhism as an intellectual resource, mm -hmm. Tang Taiyan. Yeah. And I wonder to what extent there are parallels between the two in terms of intellectual project. Mm -hmm. Did they know each other? They, they didn't know each other. Sutras? Okay. Zhang Taiyan was one of his heroes as a young man. It was Zhang Taiyan that convinced him that Buddhism and what he called socialism, but it really meant more anarchist socialism, uh, were compatible, right? So he read Zhang Taiyan. Um, Zhang Taiyan, right, read the Yogacara Bhumi Shastra in prison, um, right? Which sometimes historians will say, oh, he read that for spiritual comfort. Like nobody reads the Yogacara Bhumi Shastra for spiritual <laughs> comfort, right? It's an extraordinarily difficult text. It's like reading process philosophy uh, or something like that. It's not something that you read because it makes you feel good inside. Um, but yeah, so there's definitely that's definitely one that's part of what was tied up in the uh, the wave of interest in Yogacara, mm -hmm. right? So he is pulling directly from Zhang Taiyan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I tell you all that I'm currently auditing Professor Richter's course in Karma, mm -hmm. and it's a real treat. If any of you have a chance for an hour on a Tuesday or Thursday, it's wonderful. But my question is, as you have taught. The Buddhists don't have a tradition of heretics. Mm -hmm. They don't isolate a given belief system. If they did have such a concept of heretic, how would they react to this new restatement of Buddhism? Which group would be most opposed to it? So there, there was friction with adherents of Amitabha Pure Land. So Amitabha and Pure Land in this period is becoming narrower. Uh, more focused on a smaller body of texts. Uh, there's a figure named Yin Guang, who's in part uh, very important to this. Taishu has a lot of respect uh, for Yin Guang, although not as much for his followers. Uh, and so there's some sort of sniping between Taishu students and some of Yin Guang's followers. Not a lot, but there's some. Uh, and then when Taishu dies in 1947, so one of the reasons that this gets forgotten is World War II happens and everything is just sort of blown up, uh, in many cases literally. Uh, Taishu dies in 1947, they lose the Civil War in 1949, and about half of Taishu's students get stuck on the mainland and die or disappear, and then a few end up in Taiwan or Hong Kong, one of whom is Yin Xun, and Yin Xun is the greatest scholar monk probably in the last 1300 years, right? So just a huge towering figure. And he has more ambivalence about this, which I talk about in the book, but he lifts this stuff up uh, and talks about it in a way that makes people extraordinarily angry. Uh, so they actually burn his book, uh, which I think is the only time mm. that Buddhists have burned another Buddhist book, at least that I'm aware of. Uh, so Pure Land followers uh, in central Taiwan had a big bonfire with copies of his book called uh, A New Treatise on Pure Land. So they did react to it in ways that were sort of like seeing it as heresy, um, I guess Did that answers Theravada, the question. Theravada Buddhists could accept this? Oh no, Theravadans, no. No, I mean, they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't accept, they would have stopped accepting things so long before you got to this that they wouldn't, have, they wouldn't be listening anymore at this point. Right? They would at most be saying, oh, that, that's nice. Right? It, it, it's nice that that works good for you. Um, but uh, they wouldn't accept, they wouldn't accept uh, 
any of these texts as authentic or as authoritative in any way. Right? It would be like it would be like a Christian talking about uh, their understanding of Mark to somebody who's Jewish. Right? Well, that's cool, but I don't agree with any of your starting points. So. <laughs> Yeah. Is that what happened to Buddhism in India? That what you're saying, they just eclipsed the progress of Buddhism in India because Ashoka took over mm -hmm. India in the fourth or fifth century, and then Buddhism was his religion. After that, Buddhism mm -hmm. took a die, basically disappeared mm -hmm. to Tamsala where the Buddha and the current uh, leader lives. So what happened in Buddhism in India is complicated, and I think we're still figuring it out. Um, but part of what happens is an economic shift. So in the time of Ashoka, you have an imperial system where you have merchants going all over, um, all over India, and money is a more important form of wealth. After that, or maybe sometime after that, I'm not as strong in Indian history, right? you have a shift to small local kingdoms, and land becomes the primary form of wealth. Uh, that makes Buddhism a little bit less mobile. It used to be associated with uh, these merchant classes uh, and sort of travel along trade routes with them. As that became less of a thing, Buddhism was more localized, right? And you tended to have these very large institutions that had land as their primary wealth. So basically they turned into something quite like uh, universities, right? So they were reliant on their, this endowment of land uh, and that in part ended up meaning that they became isolated and they had relatively weak grassroots, and so they sort of became more and more rarefied. The bhakti devotional movements uh, arose and sort of uh, sort of took over at the grassroots level, right, got a lot of enthusiasm, and Buddhism became this very ivory tower sort of pursuit, and then when, uh, right, you have the invasions, right, a lot of times these institutions were walled, uh, so the invading armies of the Mughals would look at these, they're walled, they look like they could be a fort, uh, and so they would attack them, uh, and so a lot of those institutions died out. So the follow-up question to that is that uh, before the Mughals came invading, mm -hmm. there was a meantime other rulers like the Gupta dynasty mm -hmm. and all those had dealt with Buddhism on a different level. So there's a comparison going on about how the Hindu dominated India deals with any insurgent religions in that territory, how they deal with the, the progression or extinction of those religions. Mm -hmm. Do you have any comment on that? No, I mean, I, I, do, I do China and kind of the other end of history. Uh, so I sort of have the broad outlines of what happened with Buddhism in India, but I can't go to that kind of a fine-grained level. Sorry. I'm intrigued by the, the concept of the pull of oh. modernity that you discussed. And I'm just curious, do you see that more often, um, I don't know how to phrase this, it's sort of a collective type movement, like the whole group mm -hmm. is mobilized by the pull of modernity, or is it more often that you see it one particular individual being you know, affected by that magnetism? So, yeah, so one of the things that I do is, in the book is try to think about how his relationship to the group. Uh, and part of what makes him so influential is just the kind of platforms that he has. Uh, he's one of the most important figures in Buddhist publishing. Uh, in the first half of the 20th century, he is the founder of a whole series of seminaries. So some of the first modern seminaries uh, in China, right, so where they have syllabi and textbooks and blackboards and microscopes for science class and, and a science class. Um, right, he starts all of that, and so there's this whole cohort of young monks. So I think they don't always agree with him, uh, but nevertheless, he has this platform to speak to a large group of people. Uh, and a lot of the time, they sort of take things that he says uh, more to their logical conclusions, maybe sometimes more than he would really like. Uh, but I think one of the key things is sort of the youth uh, of both him, sort of in that early period, and then of his students later on. Uh, so for them, you know, so the 1911 revolution, when you're looking at religious history, that period is often treated as a crisis, right? So the imperial state goes down, uh, the exam system and Confucianism is destroyed, right? It's a crisis, right? Well, you know, 
whether something's a crisis or not depends on your perspective, right? If you're invested in the system as it exists, that's a crisis. If you're not, wow, it's an opportunity, right? Everything is up in the air. And for a lot of young people in this period, I mean, one of the things that I think makes the early 20th century kind of oddly foreign for how close it is, is how confident people were, or at least some people were, that they really had it figured out. Like, we know how this stuff works. So now all we have to do, right, is follow this one simple trick, and then boom, we'll have an anarchist utopia. And, you know, it might take a while, and, you know, oftentimes as figures get older, they kind of keep pushing it back, right? So like Wu Zhihui, uh, right, so it keeps pushing anarchy back further and further into the future. But people really have this confidence that they understand how society works, and now that we know this, we just have to do it, and we can make a perfect future, right? At this point where, I mean, you have warfare all the time. I mean, there's all kinds of disruptions throughout Taishu's lifetime, but there's also this tremendous sense of optimism that I don't feel like we have anymore, despite having a lot more material advantages. I just have to share it. It's after about Okay. <laughs> All right. So I, I think there was a crossroad between Taishu and Theravada. By the time we get the Abhidhamma in, in uh, Theravada, we have a discussion that leads to something called the... Uh, so we have a discussion of bases and roots. Mm -hmm. So it, in that sense, we do cross over here in the sense that the things are not... Actions are not necessarily black and white, mm -hmm. balanced and evaluated. So that I think there is a blend here. And I, and I thought it remarkable... Um, of that blend with the Abhidhamma, uh, there is a crossover with Theravada. Tiny, tiny yeah, no, the the, yeah. the Yogacara movement actually builds off of Abhidharma in a yeah. lot of ways, right? So Vasubandhu, if you know Vasubandhu, right, writes the Abhidharma Kosha, and then yeah. supposedly he's trans, or uh, not translate, uh, converted to Mahayana, and then he starts writing these Yogacara texts that have like the long list of dharmas and all that kind of stuff. So, like in a lot of ways, Yogacara is kind of Mahayana Abhidharma. Yeah, I, I kind of call it jihadi Okay. <laughs> Jokingly. Yep. All right. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you.